Um, so this work is um, um, a collaboration of a, um, a large number of people, um, including um, those at Argo National Lab. Um, uh, Liang Li in particular did uh, most of the spectroscopy simulation that I will show. Um, Arun Menodi um, has uh, done a lot of the machine learning work um, in collaboration with students uh, from a really excellent data science program at the University of Washington. Um, in particular, Justin Potthoff did a lot of the machine learning. Um, and then I work with, I have the pleasure of working with a, a number of excellent spectroscopists. Um, Jun Sun Park and, and Tim Fister are in the uh, uh, battery community. Um, John Freeland um, and Chen Jun Sun and Steve Field um, are in advanced, advanced photon source. Um, Jordi Cabana and his group at UIC, um, as well as uh, Teak Boyko at the Canadian Light Source. Um, I also work with um, people who have um, focused on sort of specific energy materials, um, such as Mariana Batoni and her group in Arizona State, um, and then also other uh, computational groups, such as Serving Long's group at UCSD. Um, so before I uh, talk about our work, I want to just advertise a little bit. Um, we are at the uh, DOE Nanoscale Science Research Centers, um, in particular Center for Nanoscale Materials at Argonne. Um, it's a completely free user facility for open science research. Um, users can be from around the world. Um, and just like the advanced world control we're familiar with, um, uh, the Center for Nanoscale Materials provide facilities, uh, staff expertise, and as, as well as uh, theory modeling and computational capabilities um, to those who might be interested. Um, so today I'm going to talk about application of um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy in energy materials, uh, more, um, you know, sort of um, uh, focus on energy storage, but also uh, with some um, discussion on a system on catalysis, uh, in particular CO2 photoreduction, um, as well as photovoltaics, in particular impurities and dopants. Um, so we may be well familiar with uh, the use of um, X-ray absorption to look at uh, chemical changes, local environment changes in energy storage materials and catalysis. But in photovoltaics, it's also important and sort of an emerging area to look at uh, impurities and dopants inside the material using XAS. Um, as as you, many of you will know, um, XAS is good for um, looking at uh, structural identification um, such as um, things like oxidation state, bonding environment um, orientation, and local coordination, but also, um, you know, sort of a, a much more tricky experiment um, to, to perform, but uh, uh, important and useful when it's successful um, is the, to, the determination of um, surface absorbates um, and, and their local environment and chemical uh, information. Um, and that is particularly important in catalysis because catalysis happens on the surface. Um, in particular, I'm going to focus my talk on um, Zane's exoabsorption near edge structure. Um, and there are several um, edges that we'll be looking at. Um, it's not a, sort of not a complete list, um, um, but um, it, it, we, we span the energy range from soft X-ray, oxygen K-edge to very hard X-ray, um, 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 the 3D transition metal K-edge, for example. And um, those give you information about oxygen state, chemical species, as well as local geometry. And I, I won't belabor that as this group is well familiar. But um, there was a an, an, um, uh, comment, you know, uh, almost 30 years ago now um, about the, the uh, thing, um, structure and information. Um, so one of the statement that was highlighted here by this paper from Abe et al. is that um, it's very difficult um, to actually determine the reason that the spectrum is changing. Um, it's often very uh, straightforward to see that uh, in operando and in situ studies that you have a change in the spectrum, but why that change is actually occurring is very difficult um, without theoretical calculation. So we highlight this because it supports our sort of approach and goal, which is um, to really use uh, atomistic level simulations and uh, to, to model the real system um, and accurate as, as accurate as possible, saying simulation in order to um, um, uh, determine, pin down the source of the changes in the spectrum. 
Um, so this is a um, goal. And then there are um, uh, other experts in the field um, who've developed a lot of um, great computational code. And we've heard from a couple in this seminar series. Um, just a quick review of the theoretical toolbox. Um, so we rely heavily on density functional theory, DFT. Um, the reason that it, is that it gives us the structure um, that is responsible for all the changes in the material um, as they are operated, as, as, um, as it is, it's being synthesized and so on and so forth. Um, so for any kind of modeling of things, it's impossible without a, a, a spectrum that is a, a structure that represents the real system. So we use DFT primarily um, to determine the structure. But of course, um, DFT can also be used um, to sort of very roughly determine a spectrum. Um, however, DFT suffers um, from um, a, a wrong band structure and underestimation of band gap. Um, excited states are basically all off, um, as well as a lack of electron hole uh, interaction. Um, so there's a, a one more step approximation beyond DFT in a many body perturbation series um, called GW. Um, that accounts for the uh, screen Coulomb interaction between the electrons. Um, therefore, the uh, band structure is now correct with GW. However, it still does not account for the electron hole pair. And so the interaction of the excited states with the core hole is not accounted for. And that's why we needed an additional level of approximation in the many body perturbation theory called beta salpeta equation or BSE for short, um, which accounts for the uh, electron hole interaction um, and uses the GW corrective band structure. And that's the level of approximation that gives us usually a uh, pretty good um, zanes. Um, so in density functional theory, we have a Kong-Sham equation, which is very analogous to the Schrodinger equation, um, except for the fact that um, it's for one single electron and all the interactions between electrons is thrown into this exchange correlation functional. Um, Kongsham uh, really is supposed to be for ground state um, um, properties, even though we do get excited state um, energy levels, but as I mentioned, they were not accurate. Um, but X-ray absorption uh, relies on the unoccupied density of states, the screen coho effect and transition matrix elements. Um, so therefore, as I mentioned, the two particle electron hole picture is required. Um, the beta subpeter equation approach uh, makes use of a um, um, the electron hole interaction um, and, and includes um, some a, a, a attractive direct interaction as well as repulsive exchange term. Um, as I mentioned though, um, in, the, in the, this, uh, this lecture series, there was a very uh, nice talk by the developer of the code that we use um, that uses beta sub beta equation, John Vincent. Um, so I would encourage everyone to um, take a look at this talk if they, if they happen to miss it. Um, so we uh, rely heavily on this code that uh, John had developed called uh, OCEAN, obtaining co-excitation from an initial electronic structure and NIST uh, beta cell beta equation solver. Um, OCEAN is built upon um, earlier work by Eric Shirley, um, and we have um, benefited uh, greatly from their guidance. Um, so one of the sort of reason to use Ocean, um, it is computationally uh, much more expensive than um, another code that's very popular, which is FEF. But um, however, um, we have seen that uh, the simulated uh, spectra um, are a lot more accurate when we use um, Ocean compared to FEF. And this is an example for the Cooper's oxide uh, copper KH. Um, we've also uh, done sort of a, a, a study of um, more comprehensive study of 3D transition metal, um, uh, K, mostly K edge, but uh, also some L edges. Um, uh, 3D transition metal, as you all know, um, are very important um, for catalysis, batteries, and so on. And, and you know, a lot of processes of life, um, just because they are earth abundant and they can um, have redox couples. Um, that are important for all these reactions. Um, so in all of these figures, um, the black ones are experimental spectra that uh, are obtained from literature, and the red ones are the simulated spectra. And as you can see, there's a very high level of accuracy um, uh, obtained by ocean. Um, so the, uh, the theoretical and computational tools um, are, are described. Um, should I pause here for any questions? I don't know if there are any questions yet. Um, is, which is I think uh, uh, I'll ask one. Um, uh, what would be the general characteristics of a problem 
where you think Ocean would uh, give more accurate results than, say, FEF? Um, so we have generally found that um, the, the um, transition metal uh, oxide, uh, well, mostly oxide transition metal compound K edges um, do tend to give uh, better accuracy. Um, I also learned from a collaborator that um, carbon um, tend to sort of um, not do as well with F as with ocean. Uh, but it's, it's true that we don't have a comprehensive study um, of, you know, sort of all the different um, elements and all the different edges that are of interest, and that would be really useful. Um, one of the hurdles is that um, the computational cost is quite substantial, I see. and um, the, the code doesn't, um, you know, th there are some uh, intricacies that are slightly more difficult than DFT calculation, so it's harder to do a high throughput study. Okay, um, uh, we have a question from Joshua Elliott. Can you unmute Josh and ask your question? Yeah, so uh, my question is uh, in the comparison between Ocean and uh, FEF, assuming, so, so I, I've never heard of FEF. So assuming that this is also a GWB, the Salpeter equation code, are the starting set of Kernchamp wave functions the same? So is it the, is it the, the, the DFT starting point that's causing the difference in the spectrum, or is it the, the, the many-body perturbation theory that's causing the difference in the spectrum? FEF is not a many-body perturbation theory code. It's a multiple scattering code. Um, okay. okay. Linear muffin tin orbitals. Um, so it's a very different approach. Um, it is amazingly fast uh, compared to any kind of um, DFT calculation even, um, and, and exceedingly fast compared to... Sure, sure. Um, okay. So, so it's a completely different approach, and um, for for the cost, FEF is actually you know quite quite good. Um, yeah, that's perfect. Okay. All right. We have another question from uh, Sami Vasala. Can you unmute Sami? Yes. Hello. Hey. Great. Yeah. So, just in general, is the BSC calculation uh, applicable for emission spectra? calculations and ocean code uh, specifically? Um, actually, I have one uh, slide at the very end. Uh, we've tried uh, ocean for emission and um, for valence to core emission. It actually works reasonably well. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. And uh, last question from Matthew Marcus. Yeah, so yeah, does ocean uh, get the multiplet effects correct so you can do transition metal allied just like iron and manganese? Um, we haven't tested that yet. We sort of stayed away from the middle 3D. Um, it has no right to do it correct. And according to John and Vincent, it, when I, if I remember him correctly, it really doesn't. Um, but yeah, the, the, there are certain, um, you know, multiply effects that aren't included. And, and um, you know, it wouldn't be possible to use a single determinant type, type approach to, to- Right, how about calcium? I don't L-edge. Yeah, I, I do not know. Um, yeah, we really, like like I mentioned to uh, Jerry, it really would be good for um, the community to get together um, and, and sort of test out the codes, um, you know, not just Ocean, but also uh, other new coming codes that, that have um, different capabilities. And we're sort of working on it, but um, I think more efforts on that uh, will, will certainly be welcome. Yeah, grand comparison over many different systems and many codes would be great, but uh, of course, it's a huge amount of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's two more questions I'll paraphrase. Um, first one is whether energy shifts are used in ocean to register with experimental data? Yes. Okay, but it'll be, would it be self-consistent to cross calculations for many different compounds from one, uh, from one element? Um, yes, it, it, for different um, calculations from the same element, you 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 can use because um, the shift has to do with the suitable potential, so um, you can use the same shift. Okay. Uh, we have this question about shifts because uh, we've had experiments done on two different beam lines and they differ by three eV. So um, I, I'm not uh, educated enough to really figure out this whole shift issue, and and I'm very happy to talk to people about it. Okay. And uh, last, there's a question. If you can say something about the relative accuracy for Zanes between Ocean or FDM, FDMES. Um, we have not extensively tested FDM and ES for Zanes either. Uh, for XES emission, uh, we found that the, the performance were similar. So it is okay. 
possible that the MNES um, can do, you know, a good enough job uh, uh, compared to Ocean for, for things as well, but we haven't tested that. Okay. Thank you for taking all those questions. You should continue. Yeah, thanks. Um, so here um, uh, we have a story about um, using copper KH things to observe um, CO2 activation on, on CO2O. And this is actually one of the hardest uh, uh, problem to study uh, catalysis um, because as I mentioned, catalysis happens on the surface. Um, things is a bulk measurement. Um, so, so the signal is always gonna be very weak. Um, so in um, CO2O is a CO2 reduction catalyst, um, and it's recently gotten a lot more attention uh, in, in, in um, um, addition to copper uh, for making methanol out of CO2, which is great for carbon sequestration. Um, what we are interested in is the effect of surface poikiometry and um, characterizing, determining whether the characterization of um, you know, these catalytic reactions actually feasible uh, from simulation. Um, so we look at uh, the cuprous oxide 110 surface and um, we look at uh, different kinds of surface defects. Um, now, this is an important point because uh, when we come up with a structural model, we always use a perfect structural model. Um, you know, we might get one result, but real material, especially on the surfaces, um, are often highly defected. Um, so we look at um, oxygen vacancy and excess oxygen at different sites. Um, and then um, the, the numbers here are um, show the oxidation state uh, or, or charge state of um, the surface copper atoms. Um, and that sort of certainly relates to um, the same spectrum. Um, so we have looked uh, more carefully at um, oxygen deficient structure and found that that is the one that is most likely to absorb the CO2. Um, so um, uh, one, one of the um, question is that, um, you know, if we do an experiment on these surfaces, um, which surface is most likely to absorb a molecule and which surface uh, is most likely to allow that absorption to be observed. Um, so we use as a proxy the change in oxidation state uh, of the surface copper um, as a measure of how observable um, this absorption is. Um, of course, we also calculate the energy of absorption that tells us how likely the absorption is. Um, so we can see that, um, uh, and I've uh, skipped over the other surfaces that we've looked at, but our conclusion is that the 110 surface is actually the one that allows um, the absorption to be observed. Um, so we then simulate the zanes of different um, copper uh, 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 KH, and um, of course, every single copper will absorb, and our model has uh, you know, a few bulk layers and a surface layer, but in the real system, there will be a lot more bulk layers. Um, so so um, you know, the, the AVAX will be even more diminished. Um, but we can see that um, the, the surface layer definitely um, shows a shift in the um, um, copper KH compared to, to the bulk. Um, and uh, you know, very sort of detailed um, derivatives uh, will, will allow us to, to identify that small change. Um, and um, so um, this is without the absorbate, uh, copper atoms are more oxidized uh, on the surface. Um, and then we look at, uh, again, like I mentioned, the effect of surface defects and the uh, CO2 absorbed on the surface. Um, and we, we find in conclusion that um, the pristine surface um, uh, and um, the oxygen deficient surface um, show a, a shift in the um, um, sort of uh, rising edge um, at about 0.3 EV. Um, so that's it's quite a small shift. Um, and then when CO2 is absorbed, um, the shift um, is, is backwards um, by about only 0.1 EV. So that is a very stringent uh, demand on the um, um, experiments. Um, so we, we initially started working with experimental groups um, and then um, you know our role was to determine first which surface to look at um, and you know ba based on these uh, arguments that I just put off um, but um, also um, you know how big the effect is and essentially we've come to the conclusion um, that effects may be too small um, to observe. Um, and the measurements were performed at um, APS hot X-ray nanoprobe uh, at uh, sector 22 at APS, advanced photon source. Um, because of the fact that we want to amplify the uh, catalysis um, uh, signal, 
um, the experiment was performed by uh, on um, nanocrystals. Um, they are um, sort of about um, half a micron in, in size. Um, and they have different facets. And in particular, the 110 facet, which is unfortunately small, um, um, is, is the, the focus of the study. Um, and one of the unfortunate um, um, thing is that uh, the spatial resolution is only 30 nanometers. So, you know, you get the surface and a whole chunk of other things. Um, and the energy resolution is 0.5 to 1 EV. Um, so um, so the, the studies were, were published um, and um, what was observed is that, uh, well, first of all, the resolution is 0.5 and you see that there are some, you know, sort of unknown information in especially the area that we're interested in. Um, the, the copper k -H, um shows a shift in higher energy. So this is the pristine uh, as prepared material. Um, if you put it in the um, um, environment with the CO2 and H2O, um, it shifts to the right. Um, and then um, uh, when, when it's illuminated, so when, when light comes in, it shifts back a little bit um, to lower energy. Um, so the, the question is, uh, well, so the first shift is consistent with modeling, at least uh, in terms of CO2 exposure, but it's not quantitatively comparable because of the um, lack in resolution. Um, but the shift back is actually not clear, um, you know, what the origin is. Um, uh, independently, um, copper LH eels show a 2 EV shift. We, we didn't, unfortunately, didn't model the LH. Um, and more importantly, what made us realize that uh, much more work is needed is that um, the effect of water and illumination um, were not considered. Um, and, and it is not even clear to me um, exactly how the effect of illumination um, can be accounted for. Um, so, you know, you have the greater density, essentially, um, um, you know, excited uh, optical electrons and holes, and how those interact with, uh, um, you know, ex excited state electrons and core holes um, is it, not clear. Um, and one of the last questions that we have, and, and you know, the result of the study is that we have more questions than we, we, we find answers, um, is also um, reaction barriers. Um, because not only is there only one surface layer, um, there's also um, a time e e effect because um, there's only a certain amount of time that the SLO base spends um, absorbed to the surface. So, you know, high reaction barriers, um, you know, if you want to look at the initial absorption, um, actually helps because it increased the fraction of the species. Um, but then, you know, the, the reaction will be very slow. Um, so, as I said, the, the conclusion from this study is that, um, you know, we can use uh, modeling to help us uh, determine if an experiment um, is feasible and, and what best you know, to do it. And, you know, unfortunately in this case, we, we weren't too optimistic about the uh, experiments. Um, but in, in, in any case, we find out, you know, all these other effects that we, we need to be considering and, and that's the subject of future work. Um, are there any questions about the catalysis aspect? Maybe I Sorry, I got, I got stuck on mute there for a second. Uh, okay. Matthew Marcus, you had a question? Yeah, I was just thinking for the uh, copper oxide uh, that if you went to the L edge and use TEY, then uh, you'd have a, a much smaller probe depth. You'd have a probe depth of only about three, a few nanometers. And uh, I believe there are some stixums around that have TEY, so you'd be able to do that. I mean, the yeah. resolution would be of order 30 nanometers, but the probe depth would be small. Yeah, that that is a great that's a great point. Um, I, I I think yeah that that would be a good approach. To, I mean, people talk, also talk about racing incidents, um, but I I think you know using um, you know the the naturally short range of the the softer X rays might be a, a good idea. Hmm, maybe P naturally, you'd have to deposit it on a conductive surface, mm -hmm. and you couldn't and you wouldn't be able to do absorption. Because mm. PEAM has to operate in UHV. I see. I see. Yeah, I'm not. It sticks them. You could do it. Yeah. I, any. I, I think it, a lot of work is needed. I think nanoprobe is a good step, um, but certainly, you know, may not be the final answer because of the limitation in energy resolution. Okay. Uh, you should continue, Maria. Thank you. Okay. 
Thanks. Um, so the next uh, part of my talk will be on um, using oxygen KH um, to look at oxygen redox and lithium ion batteries. Um, and there are two materials that we look at. Um, one is the lithium iridate. So uh, many of you are familiar with energy storage using lithium ion batteries. Um, and the principle in which they operate um, is that there is a cathode material, which is usually transition metal oxide, and an anode material, which is usually graphite. Um, and the lithium goes back and forth between uh, the cathode and the anode. Um, so the usual energy capacity um, has to do with uh, the transition metal redox, so the transition metal being oxidized and, and reduced um, as the lithium is being added and removed, um, but the, or removed and added uh, correspondingly. Um, but the problem um, is that it, it, the capacity is often not very large. Um, and one of the recent areas of interest has been to use um, oxygen redox to try to improve. Um, so because oxygen can also be oxidized and reduced, um, you don't want oxygen to be oxidized too much because it would go from oxide to free oxygen, which is then released. Um, but you know, maybe some aspect of oxygen redox is, is um, helpful to increase the capacity of these materials. Um, uh, many years ago now, we've um, come up with this hybrid lithium ion, lithium oxygen materials. Um, so if you go to the extreme and only use oxygen redox, um, then you have a lithium air battery or a lithium oxygen battery. Um, so this hybrid idea uses both. Um, and um, oxygen redox and hybrid lithium ion and lithium oxygen are sort of, um, you know, uh, um, two sides of the same coin. Um, so there's a question of what gives rise to oxygen redox, what kind of local structure tells you that the oxygen can participate in the receiving and um, donating of electrons to, to, for, for charge and discharge. Um, there are several suggestions um, and, and many of them um, um, have to do with the local bonding of the oxygen. Um, and that's why we, we had the idea of using SANES. Um, previously to our study, um, all, all, all the work has been using um, primarily XPS, uh, which suffers you know, from, from the surface sensitivity and um, the fact that batteries are often very different on the surface than uh, in, in the bulk. Um, so the different uh, modes of oxygen redox uh, structure can be um, oxygen with a, a, a linear lithium, so lithium or lithium, um, or, you know, sort of completely surrounded by lithium. Um, and in some cases, um, there have been suggestions um, on oxygen-oxygen dimer um, being, being responsible. Um, however, you know, we, we look very carefully into this study, which was published in, in Science, um, and they have um, um, identified the oxygen-oxygen distance as something like 2.8 or 2.5 EV, uh, or sorry, angstrom. Um, but then um, at a certain projection, um, the, the, the distances are short and they call them OO dimer. Um, so, so this is, you know, problematic for us. Um, and, um, you know, because oxygen, oxygen dimer in a peroxide material, for example, is 1.56 angstrom um, and, and, and shorter for um, superoxide um, dimers. Um, so we set out to try to use um, oxygen KH sinks to um, really determine if there's any oxygen, oxygen uh, redox in this material. Um, so in terms of the uh, electrochemistry, um, the and maybe we can skip over this quickly. Um, essentially, all you need to know is that lithium can be removed and reinserted into this material uh, relatively reversibly for 50 cycles. Um, and there is a potential of oxygen loss. Um, so we calculated um, the, the structure of this material at different lithium content. Um, so we started removing the lithium from this material. Um, and then for each of them, uh, the structure, we did an ocean calculations of the um, oxygen KH sains. Um, and these are the results. Um, as in the bottom is the original material with all the lithium. Um, in the middle is when half of the lithium is removed. And in the top is when three quarters of the lithium is removed. Um, the experimental and uh, uh, data um, agrees fairly closely uh, with the, the computer data. Um, and um, what we've um, realized when we analyze the results is that the, there are two peaks, alpha and beta. Um, the alpha peak has to do with the uh, oxygen 1s, oxygen 2p, um, plus the iridium T2g orbital. So there's um, the crystal field splitting. 
um, with the, the, the T2G and the EG um, states. And then the beta peak has to do with the hybridization with the EG um, states. So in when the lithium is initially removed, um, the, the hybridization is changing. Um, but um, what we uh, find is that when lithium, uh, more lithium is being removed, um, there essentially is no change to the spectrum. So this is the, the uh, region where the previous report um, supposes that there, there is oxygen redox, but we find that there actually isn't um, a lot of change in, or any noticeable change in the system. Um, so um, we also ca carry out uh, um, more accurate um, calculations and the electronic structure also shows that there is not much change um, in the system um, in, in the last stage. Um, so um, an additional piece of information comes from the iridium um, image um, that shows the uh, iridium um, oxidation um, in the initial from, from um, uh, full lithiated to half um, delithiated, there's an uh, iridium oxidation. Um, and then the last stage is the iridium reduction. So what we concluded from this study is that um, in the initial part uh, of charge, there is an enhanced hybridization between iridium and oxygen. Essentially just charge redistribution. There's no additional capacity that the oxygen is taking up. Um, and then in the final stage, um, the oxygen, uh, Oxygen redox is inferred only from iridium reduction. However, there is no um, observable change in the um, um, oxygen KX spectrum. So this really cast doubt on the previous um, study that says in this uh, lithium iridate compound um, that there is a, a um, responsibility of oxygen to take up charge uh, during the cycle. Um, so, um, that was the one of the compound lithium iridate. Um, and I know I've been giving you negative results, but now this is a positive result. Um, we have uh, also expanded the study to uh, this other material, uh, lithium iron oxide, uh, Li5 FeO4. Um, you might notice if you're familiar with batteries or vaguely seen them before that this is a lot of lithium. So usually transition metal um, oxide materials or batteries have one or two lithium um, per transition metal, but this has five. Um, so this is a very um, um, first hybrid lithium oxygen, lithium ion material, because there's so much um, lithium, there's also a lot of oxygen. So we think um, it's, it might be very useful um, for looking at oxygen redox. Um, so in fact, we published this paper um, um, on um, the, the fact that this uh, oxygen redox is observed uh, using a, a number of different techniques to, to establish um, in this material. And um, in particular, um, we find that the, the reaction is very far away from equilibrium. Um, so most importantly, we look at um, uh, this material, um, uh, oxygen K-absanes, um, as the, the uh, lithium is removed. Um, so this is what it looks like. And this study was um, done both at APS and at the Canadian Light Source, um, just, just for completeness. Um, for in the pristine material, um, the oxygen KH looks like this. Um, as you have uh, lithium being removed, um, the, there is a pH peak that grows um, until about two lithium removed and then goes shrinks back um, uh, when more lithium is removed. So this is the feature that, um, we are interested in because this might be the telltale signal of oxygen redox. Um, and then after uh, lithium two removal, we know that there's some oxygen um, loss uh, using DEMS. Um, and the way we treated this is um, looking at the structure using ab initial molecular dynamics. So we start with the lithium five FeO4. Um, we remove a couple lithium, look at the uh, a low energy structure. Um, and then put it into ab initial molecular dynamic simulations. Um, and and uh, quite to our surprise, we found that uh, we actually find oxygen um, peroxide, uh, oxygen dimer that are at the peroxide distance, as well as the superoxide distance. Um, this, uh, this is ascertained with the peroxide and superoxide um, crystal structure um, of, of, with lithium. 
Um, and then with um, these structures, we calculate the ground state density of state just to see what they look like. And um, as, as one might expect, um, you see the, the sigma star um, states from the um, OO, OO bonds um, show up in the DOS. Um, and then we calculated, um, sorry about the animation. And then we calculated um, the spectrum using different um, um, structural models. So first we have the black one. Uh, oh, sorry, we, we have the, yeah, sorry, this is shifted. The black one, it should be pointing to the black one, um, is the structure without oxygen dimer. So before we do the F initial molecular dynamic simulation, um, and we see that there is no pre edge feature, it's sort of, uh, there's a small bump here, um, but no separate peak like this. Um, and then with the um, uh, peroxo, um, the feature is, is more prominent. Um, however, uh, you know, the, the previous literature has suggested that this pre-edge feature may be due to OO bonds, um, but because we have site-dependent spectrum, um, we actually find that uh, it is due to these Li6 um, um, units instead of OO bonds. So OO bonds actually give rise to a feature much higher in energy, um, but a, a oxygen surrounded by 6 lithium actually gives rise to this feature. Um, so using these um, simulations, we've actually um, identified atomic origin of, of this uh, structural feature um, that was you know, previously not known and not in the crystal. Um, so this is an important aspect because um, you know, if, if the material stays crystalline, there's a limited number of uh, uh, crystal environment that you, you can investigate. But um, in this case, there's actually a lot of reordering. Um, and this is a, a sort of brand new um, structural motif that shows up in the AIMD that we can then um, obtain from the um, spectrum simulation. So this work was published about a year and a half ago. Um, and um, so just to summarize the, the lesson learned um, from lithium ion batteries, oxygen redox. Um, so accurate calculations are very important. Um, I think we can't start a conversation about the origin of different features in the spectrum un until we have you know, agreement between the simulated and the experimental uh, spectra that looks you know, like this or, or better. Um, so we find that spectroscopic signatures sometimes accompany oxygen redox. However, um, you know, whether the oxygen is uh, actually oxidizing or changing in hybridization is not always easy to distinguish. Um, and then a pre-edge feature that was previously believed to be from OO bonds actually came from uh, Li6 uh, O environment, which was, was sort of new. Um, and you know, this material is not gonna come to your um, uh, battery in your laptop anytime soon um, until this sort of oxygen uh, oxi oxidation is controlled uh, more reliably because I, I think nobody wants their um, battery to blow up because oxygen gas is being released. Um, any questions about these batteries? Um, yeah, well, we have uh, some related questions here. Um, Anne-Marie, you had a question? Uh, yeah, hi, Maria. Um, this is all very interesting. Thanks for your talk. Um, I was just wondering about how bulk sensitive these oxygen cage measurements are. And uh, I mean, could the, could the penetration depth be playing some sort of role in what is being experimentally observed or not? Um, so these were um, done using total fluorescence revealed. Um, so it's a little more depth uh, sensitive. I, I can't remember the exact number. It's not five nanometers, it's more like 20 nanometers. Um, there are experts in, in here who can probably correct me, but um, yeah, so we, we did worry a lot about this, um, um, both the surface sensitivity of the technique as well as um, you know, surface changes as the sample is being uh, uh, transferred because this, these are ex situ. Um, so the surface was like, it was transferred very carefully in a protective environment. Um, and um, we use the fluorescent seal, which gives us more depth, as much depth as possible um, for oxygen. Okay. Uh, Wan Lee, you had a comment you wanted to make? Hi. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, Maria, I just want to mention your study on the lithium 2 uranium 3 is in great consistency as what we found with RICS. And the RICS result, uh, we found clearly there is no oxygen redox in I'm that system. 
Yeah, it, yeah it's, 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 it's very clearly. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's great. It's always good to hear. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy because, you know, you guys are a real experts. Um, you know, we went into this thinking that just from a in, in the meantime, the size people. In yeah. the meantime, the science paper has been cited still by thousands of times. <laughs> uh, but if they pay attention to spectroscopy, like what we have been discussing in this forum, uh, that kind of huge mistake could be easily avoided. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, yeah, I think for the community, we sort of need to go up against XPS in some way. Um, XPS is not, you know, yeah. uh, without merit, but sometimes it can be dangerous. Yeah. Um, anyway, thanks, Wan Lee, for the comment. Okay. Thank you. One, one last thing, Maria. Um, uh, it really does look like more and more soft X-ray beam lines are going to have transition edge sensor arrays, which will let them do soft XES much more conveniently than uh, the very large instruments needed for gratings for uh, XES. In oh. this study, when you look at the oxygen K edge and you mainly see the uh, a lot of the interesting changes are down in that very first uh, that very first uh, unoccupied state it yeah. makes me wonder if you've also calculated the valence to core xes from oxygen and whether that might uh, similarly have a feature and the reason i bring this up is that the sample prep is a lot easier uh, that's not true. I guess they're doing electron yield often. Okay, don't worry about the sample prep. In any event, what are your thoughts about the valence decor XES from the oxygen in this case? Um, we really would love, no, we, well, okay, I haven't thought of the oxygen valence decor, but we really would love more valence decor capabilities. Um, and and you know, uh, we've been working with Chen Junsan and, and Seafield. Uh, but there's certainly a, a signal issue because the core to core dominate. And maybe that's not true for the oxygen. Is that well, it's not true, but the, the problem is the fluorescence yield is very low and the experiment is uh, particularly challenging on the spectrometer side. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are, um, you know, sort of heavily reliant on you guys to solve the, all the problems. <laughs> so we can sit back and, you know, explain things the way we want it to. So. <laughs> okay, very good. You should continue. Thank you. Um, and lastly, the last part of my talk, um, it's about using machine learning to extract uh, local structure information from Zanes. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the reason for this uh, probably needs no explanation. There's been a lot of talk about using machine learning. Um, and um, we have a few examples where um, things have worked out reasonably well um, from Zanes. Um, and um, the, the goal, of course, is always um, to determine the atomic structure and chemical properties, um, you know, things like oxidation state, local coordination numbers, um, coordination geometries, and so on and so forth. Um, we've used a couple systems. Um, first, I want to talk about the same system I just mentioned, li 5 fe 4 um, and in particular, you know, this whole um, Li3 FeO 3.5 structure where um, some lithium has been removed and we have a lot of AIMD data and the spectrum is changing dramatically. Um, we want to know if it is possible to determine the local environment um, from, from things using machine learning. Um, so um, we picked uh, a classification problem where um, the iron... Um, uh, uh, the number of iron surrounding an oxygen is uh, what we want to predict. Um, so all the oxygen are surrounded by cations um, and there's usually an octahedral-like environment, so there are six of them, uh, but that, that those cations could either be uh, lithium, uh, which is green here, or iron, which is brown here. Um, so the number of iron um, can, any, can be anywhere from zero to four um, in, in our system. And um, we used um, this um, computed spectra that we have uh, uh, talked about just now. Um, and the, the, the good thing is that ocean calculations are expensive, but you get you know, a, a spectrum for each absorbing atom. Um, so there are about 50 atoms, uh, oxygen atoms in each supercell. Um, so we get 50 spectra. Um, and then the different, for each snapshots, we, we get 50 spectrum. So we can get a, a good number of data. And um, data is always the critical aspect for any kind of machine learning study. 
Um, so um, we use a simple uh, neural network architecture, so it's a shared neural network, um, so, uh, and then we use um, the um, classification uh, as the final output layer from zero to four IM surrounding the oxygen. Um, so there's a, a simple toy model that we started with, which is um, suppose I have a single um, absorbing atom and a zanes corresponding to that. Of course, that's not real. You know, you can never measure zanes from a single atom. Um, um, but you know we have the data available. So we want to know if we can classify that um, very very well. Um, so we use a um, um, all the data we have uh, and break it down into training, cross validation, and test set. Um, and we find that the accuracy of the classification is is, is very high, so you know ninety five to hundred percent. Um, so um, all the um, zero iron, which includes Li six O as well as the oxygen dimer, um, and four um, iron um, are correct. The, all the predictions are correct. So the mistakes are sometimes when you have two um, and it predicts three and so on. Um, so, of course, that is only a toy model that was just to test, you know, if these neural networks make any sense at all. Um, but then we, we started, you know, dealing with a more, more accurate or a more um, uh, realistic problem, which is um, if you have a, a spectrum comprised of many different absorbing atoms, can you actually uh, determine the average coordination number? Um, from for an average spectrum from, from the average things. Um, so there's a 49, uh, not 50 spectrum. So there's a, per structure, we have 18 structures. Um, so 18 ocean calculations give you about 900 individual atom spectrum, but then we can combine them, we combine the spectrum from different structures uh, in any way we want. So, so we, we actually can get 10,000 um, different data for training model, for training in this model. And, and 10,000 is roughly the number that you need for a lot of these, um, you know, if you have a thousand, you can start doing things, but um, if you have a neural network, usually about 10,000 is, is needed. Um, so you have, we have instead of a regression task rather than classification, we want to know the average. Um, and this is the results here. Um, the, there's different types of um, training learning rate that we used. Um, but the, the key um, point is here. This is the iron coordination number and the x-axis as calculated uh, in the DFT models. Um, and then the vertical axis is the predicted um, uh, average coordination number in the, from the neural network. Um, the the f, f the error uh, mean uh, root mean square error is about 0.06, um, and you know the average coordination number is about you know 1.5. So you can roughly see that's a four percent error. Um, and um, we have also tried the same thing um, to predict the oxygen charge. You know maybe there are a better way to determine um, a charge state of an absor absorbing atom from things, but this is just something we 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 also want to test. Um, and um, the um, approach uh, is very similar. We have um, these uh, absorption um, spectra from individual atom. Um, and then for each of them, we have a uh, predicted, um, sorry the, for switching the predicted and the um, DFT values here. Um, but essentially we have a few percent accuracy. Um, we can predict the, the charge on the oxygen um, as measured by DFT. So DFT gives you a charge on each individual atom. Um, and um, the, the mean absolute error is about 0.03. You know, the, the charge ranges from um, a peroxide-like, which is about minus one, to oxide-like, which is about minus two. Um, so just to, you know, uh, this was a rather exotic battery material. So we want to extend this to a more typical cathode materials, such as uh, um, nickel manganese cobalt, which we call NMC uh, material. And in this case, we're looking at uh, not the oxygen KH, but the transition metal KH. Um, so as you remove lithium, which are in green here, um, the, the, the oxygen, uh, the, the transition metal oxidation state will change in this case. Um, and depending on how many lithium are removed, which are local or near the transition metal, um, you can have a different um, um, uh, things uh, from from the transition metal. Um, so we use a calculated thing spectrum, and in this case, we use FEF um, just for speed, uh, because unlike the previous case, we have a lot of um, different structure, 
instead of a small number of structure with a lot of atoms and, and in the calculations uh, for a lot of structures, you know, tend to be um, quite, quite expensive. Um, so um, there are 251 uh, saying spectra calculated. Um, and then again, we use this combination approach to get 10,000 points. Um, and instead of uh, neural network, we look at uh, random forest regression, which is another type of uh, machine learning method. Um, that determine that depends on a, a sort of a decision tree type approach, um, and here are the results um, on the horizontal axis: the DFT um, uh, coordination number, CN stands for coordination number, and the vertical axis is the machine learning prediction. Um, and these are the errors. Um, the test error is what you should look at. Um, it's about 0.13, so um, on an average of two, so about six percent. Um, and here is about 4% um, for nickel and cobalt. So fairly similar to the previous results, even though, you know, completely different system, um, different machine learning approach. Um, and we're actually um, continuing to do this for other systems. Um, so I mentioned earlier that photovoltaics um, is, is sort of an un unusual, um, um, you know, user of SANES. Um, but uh, uh, for example, in uh, cadmium telluride solar cells, um, copper is present and the local uh, copper coordination number um, tells you about um, um, sort of the, the defect structure and it's important for determining the recombination time and so on. Um, so we've um, also used the same approaches um, in your network um, on the prediction, and actually the prediction looks really good. Um, these are FEV calculations um, for different copper and, and tellurium arrangements. Um, and then we start, started adding noise, and then the, the performance sort of starts degrading um, a, a bit. Um, so uh, in addition, and I'm not showing all the, the plots here, um, in addition to neural network models, we also use um, uh, random forest, Gaussian process, Colonel Ridge, um, and we find came to, came to the conclusion that the, the, the results are actually quite similar. Um, there are not a strong dependence on the type of machine learning method and really getting the data right and getting the data to be as, as numerous as possible is the, the key issue here. Um, so in terms of the lesson learned, um, the class for machine learning of saints, um, um, classification re regression problems work well. Um, um, we've applied it to oxygen and transition metal K edges. Um, we've applied it to batteries and solar cells. Um, it's critically important to have an accurate computed spectrum for machine learning to work, otherwise garbage in, garbage out. Um, and um, one of the things that we're still actively investigating is the, the noise uh, issues, how adding noise might degrade the performance. Uh, but, you know, we actually know what percentage of noise, you know, completely breaks it, so it might be useful there. Um, I just want to give 30 seconds approach. So all of this previous machine learning work has to do with you know, if I have the structure, uh, if, if I have the spectrum, what kind of um, sort of uh, local descriptor of structure can I get? Um, we want to go a little further and actually get a structure. And oftentimes that's not possible with Zanes alone, but we can have Zanes, we can have uh, PDF, we can have, um, you know, Rama, and we can have other types of data. And um, this uh, framework called Fantastics is what I've been developing um, to determine the um, structure uh, uh, from one or more types of characterization data using a combination of match experiments and energies. And I'm, I'm very interested in any kind of data set, you know, anything where you have uh, data and you want to figure out what the structure is, um, I, I am I'm, I'm keen to, to have a look and, and work on it. Um, so just to conclude my talk, um, I know I leave not very much time, um, so I'm not going to read through it. Um, I just want to um, quickly show, someone ask about um, XES. So these are the uh, VTC um, XES spectrum comparing FTM NES and Ocean. Um, they compare very well, um, you know, uh, not perfect, and neither compare perfectly to experiment, but they're, you know, both pretty good. Um, the, notably, there's um, um, a, a missing uh, 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 peak here, which, you know, we need to sort of investigate further. Um, CTC-XES, um, of course, require, re relies more on the multiplet type codes. 
Um, and this is a project that uh, it's um, sort of ongoing with uh, Steve Heald and, and Chen Jun Sun, um, and recently also um, involving um, Ellie Stafitsky at, at Brookhaven. Um, so all this work was funded um, by a battery center, by a solar energy technology office, um, scientific user facility at DOE and um, Argon. Um, and as I said, um, the Center for Nanoscale Materials is a free user facility. Please um, contact me if you're interested. And I'm gonna leave this conclusion slide up while uh, we take any other questions. Thank you, that's a great talk. There are indeed questions. I'm gonna uh, specifically uh, uh, emphasize the questions on the last part of your talk, the ML work. Uh, yeah. So to um, uh, to begin, uh, Nong Artrith, you have a, you have a question? Hi, Nong. Hi, Maria. Thanks very much. Great talk. So actually, uh, some of my, I mean, I already typed questions on the chat, but you also slowly answer my questions already at the end. But anyway, I would like to ask, like, uh, what kind of descriptors and features that you use to describe your, your model for machine learning models? Because uh, you use just for the crystal structures, only 2.6 angstrom, for example, that you show very early slides. But I'm wondering, like, uh, if we have like amorphous structures or the edge interface, which is we need larger or longer range. So what type of the uh, descriptors or that you use in the machine learning model? Yeah, so, so you know, the, of course there's the, the typical uh, charge, you know, you, you can derive a charge from a beta charge, that's, that's the descriptor you can use. Um, there's the, the local coordination number with a cutoff um, that we've often used. Um, if it's not perfect, you can tweak it, improve the definition for the coordination number. Um, um, and then um, we've also uh, used the cooler matrix, which is a sort of more intricate um, description of the local coordination that involves also the charge of the um, nearby environment, um, like all the atoms. Um, it's it's a it's a good question, like you know how you represent the structure in terms of featureizing it, um, the the or just you know descriptor um, descriptorize it, describe it. Um, yeah, so so I think more work can be done. Um, there are people who um, um, who did this other um, um, neural network study, and and you know they represent the structure uh, in in sort of a cooler matrix-like way, but uh, involving, you know, also the, the um, additional uh, electronic information. So how much more um, elemental information you include in it is, is sort of uh, up, up for debate. The main question is how transferable do you want your model to be? So far we've done it element by element, um, you know, which is sort of my, by necessity what the thing says, uh, but you know, do you want a more universal model, you know, relative to an edge energy value and, and that will allow you to make your descriptors even more complex. Yeah, that's certainly an, an area that um, it's open for, you know, lots of research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, Joshua Elliott, uh, quickly, uh, you have a question? Yeah, so uh, specifically to do with the classification of the iron um, coordination, I was just wondering, once the model or the neural network is trained, is this uh, transferable toward the transition metal lines? No, so yeah, that's what I was just talking about. So, so far we've ever, because the edge is at a certain energy value, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so we haven't done any, um, you know, transferring from one element to another, but I was just telling them that it is not inconceivable to do that. You just have to, you know, reference the energy to an edge value um, and then you can compare. But oftentimes, so, so Shebing Ong's group has done great work on a random forest model um, uh, on um, Zanes, and they also did it element by element. Um, but you know, it, it's possible to to say look at you know down a column in the periodic table and then compare those uh, or, or something like that. Um, I I would be worried about you know comparing very far away um, across you know different elements in the periodic table just because maybe there's just nothing in common. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Um, Yang Ha, you have a quick question. Yeah, so I was just wondering, did you run a like feature importance analysis when your machine learning is finished so you can see 
which part of which energy range the computer actually used to make their decisions. So as human scientists, we could actually learn from these machines. Yeah, that, that's a great thing. So we started doing that. Uh, we didn't do this for the uh, iron oxide uh, study, but we started doing that for the more recent study that I'm, I haven't shown, um, especially on the XES. Cool, thanks. That's a great suggestion. Okay, and last question is from um, Hao Yue Guo. Hi, Marie, thanks for the talk. I think you have a party answer my question. I'm asking about for the MC zinc spectra, is it transferable to other lacy drawn on lacy structure or even the chi time mixing structure? Yeah, it's possible to, you know, uh, look at cobalt and nickel together, I think. Um, you just have to shift the edge because they, they do look like there could be some, you know, similarity. But I would strongly encourage anyone who's working in this field and interested, you know, to try that. Um, uh, there's just so many things that, that can be done and, you know, some of them could be quite fruitful. And I think this is, you know, a great forum to discuss them.